Hey, hello. Have some more of Terry Pratchett's Gads Gads, why don't you? Are you ready? We um last saw them on the rooftop, didn't we? And the dragon, do you remember it was hidden on top of the Tower of Art? And it was quite well concealed, wasn't it? But then eventually it flew down and it had just burned a building, hadn't it? Everybody was trying to shoot it with arrows to no avail. And um, yeah, our heroes, the Night Watch, were on the rooftop, weren't they? Fimes had spotted it a long time ago, though. Let's pick it up from there. Do you remember that Lady Rampkin was sitting on a on a rooftop somewhere on a deck chair? Let's pick it up with her. Lady Rampkin lowered her telescope and shook her head slowly. That's not right, she whispered. That's not right at all. Shouldn't be able to do anything like that. She raised the lens again and squinted, trying to see what was on fire. Down below, in their long kennels, the little dragons howled. So that's the sensible place to stop there. Look, I promise, look, literally from here to here. See? There it is, just one little section. Now the next section goes on for 20 pages. <laughs> I'm not going to do 20 pages because we would be here for 35 minutes. So I'll stop at an ish place tonight. Here we go. Traditionally, upon waking from blissfully uneventful insensibility, you ask, where am I? It's probably part of the racial consciousness or something. Fime said it. Tradition allows a choice of second lines. A key point in the selection process is an audit to see that the body has all the bits it remembers having yesterday. Fimes checked. Then comes the tantalising bit. Now that the snowball of consciousness is starting to roll, is it going to find that it's waking up inside a body lying in a gutter with something multiple? The noun doesn't matter after an adjective like multiple. Nothing good ever follows multiple. Or is it going to be a case of crisp sheets, a soothing hand and a business-like figure in white pulling open the curtains on a bright new day? Is it all over with nothing worse to look forward to now than weak tea, nourishing gruel, short strengthening walks in the garden and... Possibly a brief platonic love affair with a minister and angel. Or was this all just a moment's blackout and some looming humbug is now about to get down to real business with the thick end of a pickaxe half? Are there, the consciousness wants to know, going to be any grapes? At this point, some outside stimulus is helpful. It's going to be all right, is favourite. Whereas, did anyone get his number, is definitely a bad sign. Either, however is better than you two hold his hands behind his back. In fact, someone said, you are nearly a goner there, Captain. The pain sensations which had taken advantage of Vime's unconscious state to bunk off for a metaphorical quick cigarette rushed back. Vimes said, ah, and opened his eyes. There was a ceiling. This ruled out one particular range of unpleasant options that was very welcome. His blurred vision also revealed corporal knobs, which was less so. Corporal knobs proved nothing. You could be dead and see something like corporal knobs. Ankh-Morpork didn't have many hospitals. All the guilds maintained their own sanitariums, and there were a few public ones run by the odder religious organisations like the Balancing Monks. But by and large, medical assistance was non-existent and people had to die inefficiently without the aid of doctors. It was generally thought that the existence of cures encouraged slackness and was in any case probably against nature's way. Have I already said where am I? said Fimes faintly. Yeah. Did I get an answer? I don't know. Gosh, <laughs> Nobby's gone Irish. Um, I don't know where this place is, Captain. It belongs to some posh bin. She said to bring you up here. Even though Vime's mind appeared to be full of pink treacle, he nevertheless grabbed two clues and wrestled them together. The combination of rich and up here meant something. So did the strange chemical smell in the room, which even overpowered Nobby's more everyday odours. We're not talking about Lady Ramkin, are we? He said, said cautiously. Ah, oh, you could be right there. Great big biddy, mad for dragons. Nobby's rodent face broke into the most horribly knowing grin Vimes had ever said, had ever seen. You're in her bed, 
he said. Vimes peered around him, feeling the first overtures of a vague panic, because now that he could halfway focus, he could see a certain lack of bachelor sockness about the place. There was a faint hint of talcum powder. Bit of uh, boudoir, said Nobby, with the air of a connoisseur. H hang on, hang on a minute, said Vimes. There was this dragon. It was right up over us. The memory rose up and hit him like a zombie with a grudge. You're right, Captain. The talons outspread, wide as a man's reach. The boom and thump of the wings bigger than sails. The stink of chemicals. The gods alone knew what sort... It had been so close he could see the tiny scales on its legs and the red gleam in its eyes. They were more than just reptile eyes. They were eyes he could drown in. And the breath, so hot that it wasn't like fire at all, but something almost solid, not burning things, but smashing them apart. On the other hand, he was here, and alive. His left side felt as though it had been hit by an iron bar, but he was quite definitely alive. What happened? he said. Oh, it was young Carrot, said Nobby. He grabbed you and the sergeant and jumped off the roof just before it got us. My side hurts. It must have got me. No, I reckon that was where you hit the privy roof and then you rolled off and hit the water butt. What about Colon? Is he hurt? Not hurt. Not exactly hurt. He landed more sort of softly. Him being so heavy, he went through the roof. Talk about a short, sharp shower of... And then what happened? Well, we sort of made you comfy and then everyone went blundering about and shouting for the sergeant till they found out where he was, of course, and then they just stood where they were and shouted. Then this woman come running up yelling. This is Lady Rampkin you're referring to, Vime said coldly. His ribs were aching really magnificently now. Yeah, big fat party said Nobby, unmoved. Of course you can't half boss people about. Oh, the poor dear man, you must bring him up to my house this instant. So we did. Best place too. Everyone's running round down in that city like chickens with their heads cut off. How much damage did it do? Well, after you were out of it, the wizards hit it with fireballs. Didn't like that at all. Just seemed to make it stronger and angrier. Took out the university's entire widdershin's wing. And... That's about it, really. Flamed a few more things, then it must have flowed away in all the smoke. No one saw where it went. If they did, they ain't saying. Nobby sat back and leered. Disgusted, really. Her living in a room like this. She's got pots of money, Sarge says. Which she got no call living in ordinary rooms. What's the good of not wanting to be poor if the rich are allowed to go round living in ordinary rooms? Should be marble, he sniffed. Anyway, she said I was to fetch her when you woke up. She's feeding her dragons now. Odd little things, aren't they? It's amazing she's allowed to keep them. What do you mean? You know, tarred with the same brush and all that. When Nobby had shambled out, Vimes took another look around the room. It did indeed lack the gold leaf and marble that Nobby felt was compulsory for people of a high station in life. All the furniture was old, and the pictures on the wall, though doubtless valuable, looked the sort of pictures that are hung on bedroom walls because people can't think of anywhere else to put them. There were also a few amateurish watercolours of dragons. All in all, it had the look about it of a room that is only ever occupied by one person, and has been absent-mindedly moulded around them over the years, like a suit of clothes with a ceiling. It was clearly the room of a woman, but one who had cheerfully and without any silly moping had been getting on with her life while all that soppy romance stuff had been happening to other people somewhere else and had been jolly grateful that she had her health. Such clothing as was visible had been chosen for sensible hard-wearing qualities, possibly by a previous generation by the look of it, rather than its use as light artillery in the war between the sexes. There were bottles and jars neatly arranged on the dressing table, but a certain severity of line suggested that their labels would say things like rub on nightly, rather than just a dab behind the ear. You can imagine that the occupant of this room had slept in it all her life and had been called My Little Girl by her father until she was 40. There was a big sensible blue dressing gown hanging behind the door. Vimes knew, without even looking, that it would have a rabbit on the pocket. In short, it was the room of a woman who never expected that a man would see the inside of it. The bedside table was piled high with papers. Feeling guilty, but doing it anyway, Vimes squinted at them. 
Dragons was the theme. There were letters from the Cavern Club Exhibitions Committee and a friendly Flamethrowers League. There were pamphlets and appeals from the Sunshine Sanctuary of S- for Sick Dragons. Poor little Vinny's fires were nearly damped after five years. Cruel use as a paint stripper, but now... And there were requests for donations and talks and things that added up to a heart big enough for the whole world, or at least that part of it that had wings and breathed fire. If you let your mind dwell on rooms like this, you could end up being oddly sad and full of strange, diffused compassion, which would leave you to believe that it might be a good idea to wipe out the whole human race and start again with amoebas. Beside the drift of paperwork was a book. Vimes twisted painfully and looked at the spine. It said, Diseases of the Dragon by Sybil Deirdre Oglevana Ramkin. He turned the stiff pages in horrified fascination. They opened into another world, a world of quite stupefying problems. Slab throat, the black tups, dry lung, storge, staggers, heaves, weeps, stones. It was amazing, he decided after a few pages, that a swamp dragon ever survived to see a second sunrise. Even walking across a room must be reckoned a biological triumph. The painstakingly drawn illustrations he looked away from hurriedly. You could only take so much in it. There was a knock at the door. I say, are you decent? Hang on, wrong voice for Lady Rumkin. I say, are you decent? Oh, I can't, I can't remember her voice. I say, are you decent? No, we'll find it again. Uh, I've, I've brought you something jolly nourishing. Somehow, Vimes imagined it would be soup. Instead, it was a plate stacked high with bacon, fried potatoes and eggs. He could hear his arteries panic just by looking at it. I've made a bread pudding too, said Lady Rampkin, slightly sheepishly. I don't normally cook much, just for myself. You know how it is, catering for one. Vimes thought about the meals at his lodgings. Somehow the meat was always grey with mysterious tubes in it. (laughs) Uh, he began, not used to addressing ladies from a recumbent position in their own beds. Corporal Nobbs tells me, and what a colourful little man Nobby is, said Lady Rampkin. Fimes wasn't certain he could cope with this. Colourful, he said weakly. A real character. We've been getting along famously. You have? Oh, yes. What a great fund of anecdotes he has. Oh, yes, he's got that all right. It always amazed Vimes how Nobby got along with practically everyone. It must, he decided, have something to do with the common denominator. In the entire world of mathematics, there could be no denominator as common as Nobby. Uh, he said, and then found he couldn't leave this strange new byway. He didn't find his language a bit... ripe? Salty! corrected Lady Rampkin cheerfully. You should have heard my father when he was annoyed. Anyway... We've found we've got a lot in common. It's an amazing coincidence, but my grandfather once had his grandfather whipped for malicious lingering. That must make them practically family, Fimes thought. Another stab of pain from his stricken side made him wince. You've got some very bad bruising and probably a cracked rib or two. If you roll over, I'll put some more of this on. Lady Rampkin flourished a jar of yellow ointment. Panic crossed Vime's face. Instinctively, he raised the sheets up around his neck. Oh, don't play silly humbugs, man. I shan't see anything I haven't seen before. One backside is pretty much like another. It's just like the ones I see generally have tails on. Now, roll over and up with the nightshirt. Belonged to my grandfather, you know. There was no resist in that tone of voice. Vime's thought about demanding that Nobby be brought in as a chaperone, and then decided that it would be even worse. The cream burned like ice. What is it? Yeah, all kinds of stuff. It'll reduce the bruising and promote the health, the growth of healthy scale. What? Sorry, uh, probably not scale. <laughs> Don't look so worried. It's almost positive about that. Okay, there we are. All done. She gave him a slap on the rump. Madam, I am captain of the night watch, said Vimes, knowing it was a daft thing to say even as he said it. Half naked in a lady's bed too, said Lady Rampkin, unmoved. Now sit up and eat your tea. We've got to get you good and strong. Vime's eyes filled with panic. Why? He said. Lady Rampkin reached into the pocket of her grubby jacket. Made some notes last night about the dragon. Oh, the dragon. Vime's relaxed a bit. (laughs) Right now the dragon seemed a much safer prospect. (laughs) And I did a bit of working out too. I'll tell you this. It's a very odd beast. Shouldn't be able to get airborne. You're right there. 
If it's built like swamp dragons, it should weigh about 20 tons. 20 tons! It's impossible! It's all down to weight and wingspin, wingspan ratios, you see. I saw it drop off the tower like a swallow. I know! Should have torn its wings off and left a blooming great hole in the ground, said Lady Rampkin firmly. You can't muck about with aerodynamics. You can't just scale up from small to big and leave it at that, you see. It's all a matter of muscle power and lifting surfaces. I knew there was something wrong, said Vimes, brightening up. And the flame, too. Nothing goes around with that kind of heat inside it. How do swamp dragons make it? Oh, that's just chemicals, said Lady Rampkin dismissively. They just distill something flammable from whatever they've eaten and ignite the flame just as it comes out of the ducts. They never actually have fire inside them in case, unless they get a case of blowback. What happens then? Well, you're scraping dragon off of the scenery said Lady Rampkin cheerfully. I'm afraid they're not very well-designed creatures, dragons. Fimes listened. That's the best I could stop at tonight, all right? We'll finish the rest of that bit tomorrow. All right, okay. Thanks very much for listening. What, what, hey, before you go, dear, to use a term of the youth, <laughs> do you ship them? I ship them. Fimes and Le What's her name? Sybil. Fimes and Sybil sitting in a tree. <laughs> Looking at dragons when they tea. Okay. Good night. See you tomorrow. Unless you're here for a little bit of goss. We can have a bit of goss if you want. Uh, so, about my day. Hmm. I'm a bit tired today. A bit sleepy. I um, I, I, I didn't really sleep very well because I was worrying about my car. I did take it out for a little spin last night. And it was like, like that, till the engine warmed up. Then it was all right. But then, like, so I left it then overnight and went out early this morning. And it took it for an even longer drive this morning. And like I say, you're driving long like that so there's obviously something up with it but it's going and then when the engine heats up it gets to about normally when i drive it gets to about 100 degrees celsius um take away 30 and halve it if you want the fahrenheit but um it didn't heat up that much today it, it went to about 50 and like i said normally it goes halfway which is about 100 degrees celsius so um yeah I don't know, but then I had to drive to a town earlier on, and it went up to a hundred. So I don't know, and it's like, 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 say when you're at, when you're at speed and the engine is warmed up, it's okay. But when you first start it up and the engine is cold, it's driving like that. So I am um, obviously no garages are open on a Saturday afternoon, are they? <laughs> So I emailed a garage, and hopefully they'll get back to me on Monday. I can't, oh man, honestly, I'll be devastated if um, if it's bust. Actually devastated. I've, I've and do nothing. You know when you get ill and you look, <laughs> you Google your symptoms, and it's like oh my God, nah! when you read your symptoms on Google. I was um, Googling about the symptoms of the car, and, oh, man, alive. <laughs> no. None of those symptoms I want, but they all said exactly the same thing. So, um, yeah. I don't I don't want it to be poorly. I don't want to have to... Can, can you remember, long-time listeners, that between about February and June the last year... I was out without a car as well. Do you remember that long period of time where I didn't have a car? I just sat in my driveway. Oh, because I couldn't afford to get it fixed. Let's hope that's not going to happen again now, shall we? Oh, my goodness. I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. Never misjudge a puddle, all right? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so, yeah, that was that. Um... Then, uh, what else have I done today? Blake came around today because he's he's going back to university tomorrow. So, 
he um, came round to get a few bits today. His mum, his mum dropped him off round here, and he came round to pick up his guitar and his amp. And like, I think he wanted me to drive him back. And I was like, mate, my car, my car. So um, his mum had to come and get him with his guitar and amp again because obviously he couldn't walk home with that. So uh, yeah, hmm. and uh, yeah, so he came round. That was quite nice to see him quite nice, very nice to see him, uh, I don't know, nothing else really exciting has happened today, read some more of my book, uh, played some games with Floyd, Bo has been in his own little world, now he's got his, his new, his new console, he's been playing that, so I haven't really spoken to him today, maybe we'll have to two play or something later on, apparently he's run out of batteries in his other controller, so he's only got one controller, uh, Yeah, that's that's my day. It's still really, really rainy. I kind of want it to stop raining so my car will dry out a little bit. But, um, yeah, it hasn't stopped raining yet. Mm. There you go. That was my day. So, anyway, again, let's keep those fingers, toes, everything crossed <laughs> for my car to be okay. All right. I'll see you all tomorrow.